what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is going to be an amazing episode with Joe Valley of Quiet Light Brokerage and best-selling book, The Exitpreneur's Playbook. Before I formally introduce Joe, um, Joe, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out on the podcast. Um, Andrew Warner, I don't think the podcast, by the time you listen to this, it will have been out. Um, old time friend, worked with Mixergy for many years. Stop Asking Questions, his book, Stop Asking Questions. It's an amazing book. I lay into Andrew a little bit about why I don't like the title and the positioning, but uh, the book is amazing. And John Warlow, Built to Sell, check it out. I interviewed him. And then I just want to mention another book. Um, I've actually, I don't know if you know this, Joe, but I actually did listen to this book, Walker Diebel. Uh, yeah. buy it, then build, you know, check mm-hmm. it out. Um, and he is involved with quiet light as well. So before I introduce Joe, this episode is brought to you by rise 25 at rise 25. We help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships, partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And Joe, at this point, I think, you know, jo- and we've known you and Mark for a while now. Um, the number one thing in our life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships and bring on the people and companies I admire. And I found no better way over the past decade to do that than have them on my podcast. And we were talking about this before we hit record. It's an excuse for me to read up and study the cool things that person's doing in depth. And so this is giving me an excuse to binge on all things Joe Valley and Quiet Light over the past couple of days. So I appreciate that. So if you've thought about podcasting, I think you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com and learn more. And Joe Valley is a serial entrepreneur, M&A advisor, podcaster, partner at Quiet Light Brokerage, one of the top online business brokerage advisory firms in the world. He's built, bought, or sold over a half dozen of his own companies. Over the last nine years, he's mentored thousands of entrepreneurs whose goal is to achieve their own eventual exit. And his best-selling book, The Exitpreneur's Playbook. You know, I listen to you, Joe. I think someone said the book, Exitpreneur's Playbook, and you corrected them. You said, best-selling book. So I didn't want to forget that. How to sell your online business for top dollar. He shares real life stories of successful and failed exits and teaches you how to reverse engineer a pathway to your own incredible exit. Who doesn't want that? And even Gino Wickman, who's been on the podcast, author of Traction, Entrepreneurial Leap, says this is a must read. And he's personally closed, Joe has personally closed nearly $100 million in transactions and touched nearly a half a billion in online exits through the advisors at Quiet Light. So um, you can check out stuff with the book also at exitpreneur.io. And you can obviously go to Quiet Light's website as well. So Joe, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Jeremy. Heck of an intro. Heck of an intro. All Big endorsement. Accurate. To rise 25 folks. Truly, if you're going to podcast, they're the folks to work with. I do it. it. Makes my life so much easier. Thank you. Totally appreciate it. And that I, I'll give you a 20 after this is over. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's funny, you know, I was looking in my email, Joe, and I was corresponding with Jason Yellowitz in 2010 wow. and actually had an interview with him back in that day. And, and one of the things that differentiates Quiet Light is you guys are run by people in the trenches who are entrepreneurs, who have bought and sold and built businesses. So when they're having those conversations, I was listening to a conversation with you, Mark and John, and he was saying the secret sauce, like there were some people who are successful in this business and some people that he was working with that weren't. And the secret sauce and the, the people who know it themselves, right? And so I want you to just talk for a second because you've done it yourself. What is um, one of the businesses that you want to talk about for yourself that you built and ended up eventually uh, selling? Sure. So yeah, one of the secret sauces of Quiet Light is that everyone is an entrepreneur first and foremost. They've all built, bought, or sold their own online business. Most have done all three. We've had people that, like Amanda, she's been on the cover of Time Magazine for her pearl importing business. Brad rolled up. 30 content sites and sold it to private equity. Pat's been on Shark Tank, deal with Robert. 
Um, and they're all pretty amazing. And I, I think in many, most ways, actually much more uh, amazing and successful than my own personal journey. Um, I have, you know, built, bought, sold about a half dozen companies of my own. And that excludes Quiet, that excludes Entrepreneur. Um, the, the one that I sold through quite a lot, you mentioned Jason. So we'll go right there. Jason was my advisor mm. back in 2010 when I sold my own, uh, e-commerce business, my last e-commerce business. No, not quite my last, my next to last e-commerce business. Um, and it's a business that, um, really, you know, was, it's kind of a weird formation. You know, I was, I was an inbound a call center sales representative at a company called Talk America in Portland, Maine. And I was 29 years old in what is, you know, somewhat known as the drinking uh, capital of the world. There's more bars per capita than, or at least back in the day, than almost any other small city. Uh, I was eating terribly, uh, working crazy hours and just not taking care of my body. And then I tried this product. It was called Pura Fast basically purifying your body, fasting, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I felt amazing. And I thought, you know, if I ever go out on my own, oh, wait, no, if when I go out on my own, because I knew I was going to, I'm going to start a product like this. Um, that particular company made some claims that prevented them from being able to continue to advertise the product. When I went out on my own, it wasn't the first product that I launched, but it was the second product that I launched. I did a uh, radio campaign with it, did a television infomercial that completely bombed. Uh, you know, when you're recording something, you're like, yeah, I just lost a hundred thousand dollars. And that doesn't actually include the advertising. That was me. Um, was uh, this for, um, that type of product or did you actually license the product from it them? was for that type of product? So okay. I went out and created, thanks for clarifying that pure stat was done. You, know, you couldn't do anything with it. And I wouldn't license that product because of the claims that were issues that they had. So I went out and created. Uh, Pura Fast, which was, uh, you know, a same similar product, but eventually morphed it into a full line of digestive wellness products. So total vitamin package, liver cleanse, digestive um, supplements, um, digestive enzymes. You were ahead of your time that at nature. that time, Joe. I was. I, I mean, was. yeah. That's. I mean, in my background's in biochemistry as a chiropractor, and I and people weren't talking about that stuff. I mean, now it's. Like, oh, obviously, Joe, people are doing fast, but that's not back then. That is not obvious at all. Yeah, no, it was it was unique. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And instead of doing what most entrepreneurs do, which is think, oh, that's a great idea. I should do that. I took the risk and had honestly the balls to to do it. Uh, I was I made the decision on that one, actually, when I was golfing with a mentor Walter, Uncle Walter, mentioned him on my podcast as well. Um, and he was selling, uh, he, was, he was an entrepreneur turned advisor as well, not with Quiet Light, but in his own world, and was uh, brokering a deal for a lumber company that was worth a half a million dollars. We talked about how he, you know, people were buying it and how much money they would make. I'm like, my God, if I just invest $50,000, um, I'll make a half a million easily in the world that I lived in. So I pursued that and... Um, it was a challenge, but we did radio, television, and, and eventually built it out to that full digestive wellness product. And I went 100% online in 2005 and took it through the best and worst of the economy, came out the other side in 2010, just worn out, tired, exhausted, and, and wanting to move on. It was, uh, as I say, a terrible situation. I was living on a lake here in North Carolina. My kids were young. My wife would have uh, friends over and all the kids would play at the pool and then go down to the beach and go swimming in the lake. And I could see that from my, my home office where I was working 20 hours a week and I was miserable. It was just awful, Jeremy. I had to sell. You paint this amazing picture. <laughs> I know. That's why I did it. Before we it, get to that part, talk about, um, I want to talk about a high point there, but also you mentioned blowing a hundred thousand dollars. Mm, yeah. I, you know, I want to curl up in a corner right now after you saying that, because we've all been there where we've invested a chunk of money that just mm -hmm. did not go where we thought it was going to go. What, what happened? What would you, what's a lesson there for other people who's thinking of investing a chunk of money in, in something? Yeah. I invested in other people that I thought would do a better job than myself. The, the first, the first uh, TV infomercial that I produced, uh, my wife and I were the hosts, co-hosts mm. of it. And to be honest with you, we did a 
we did a pretty good job. My wife did a much better job than I did, of course. Um, the second one that we decided to do, uh, we hired a ex CNN anchorman and um, sort of the female Doogie Hauser, a, a young woman that was through med school and just brilliant. Uh, and we thought that might be the better approach instead of just us, because this was a health oriented uh, product. Um, she told me, she told, and this is when I should have just said no. She told me she wouldn't get on the plane for less than $25,000. Like, uh, okay. So I was impressed that she said that and she had the balls to say that. But at the same time, looking at me, I'm like, she's obnoxious. I really should just hang up the phone and stop moving forward. Uh, but the chemistry between him and her was absolutely horrendous. They didn't meet or speak until the day that we were recording. And, you know, you'd think the professionals would get over that and fake it. Um, and it just, there was no chemistry, which is really important when he's mm -hmm. interviewing her and, 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 and vice versa. And for $25,000, she didn't, you know, to get on, she got on the plane, but for the rest of it, she didn't even like read the script or bullet points or highlights that to focus on. And she, she had more trouble reading a, a, a teleprompter than, than I do. So um, during recording, I could, I could see that it was just coming together horribly. Um, and Why it, infomercial? Oh, because, you know, that's where I thought you had to go. You know, mm. we were crossing it on, uh, on radio uh, with 60 second spot ads. Mm -hmm. um, could have produced, you know, could have produced a, a radio television infomercial for a heck of a lot less. Um, literally, I geek like, out on direct response. So I'm fascinated by oh, man, that. I, and, and I, I had Ron Paul Peel on the podcast. Um, no, he's wow. passed away, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I geek out on that. So you did radio. What else did you do to market? Um, radio spot ads, uh, and always 60 seconds, 30 seconds didn't seem to work. Cause there was always 12 to 15 seconds of giving out an 800 number. This was pre, yeah. you know, just online stuff. Um, You're like a direct response pioneer. Keep, yeah, keep talking. Was, was, so radio, good yeah. old days. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, not, didn't, didn't do print or anything like that or, or snail mail or anything. So we just went from radio straight to, uh, you know, television. So, you know, the, the, the way that I started, Jeremy, I was actually buying media. My first company that I started in 1997 uh, was a media, uh, radio media buying, direct response mm. media buying company. And my first client um, was somebody that I didn't like or respect a whole lot, to be blunt. I was a little concerned, but fortunately, my wife said, don't burn any bridges. I, the company I left, um, he, he worked there and he, and he came forward and... Um, uh, asked me to produce, uh, help him produce spot ads for a particular product and, and then buy his media. And, and um, standing in the studio, uh, listening to him record the ads, uh, there were two ads that were recorded and we were split testing, right? That's what people do online now. We were split testing the ads. And I spent uh, $4,000 on one ad and $4,000 on the other, different stations and you know, similar rankings, see what would happen. And I remember leaving the studio and taking the cassette tape, yes, the cassette tape and putting it in my car and listening to it and, and listening to him say, how'd you like to look better naked? Now you can with Fat Assassin and going forward with, you know, the whole 60 seconds. And I'm, I'm thinking these are awful. This is just, <laughs> this is just not going to work. Um, and uh, lo and behold, um, one of them just was a screaming success and the other didn't work. And within, I want to say eight weeks, I was spending about $100,000 a week on media for that ad. I love it. Uh, and then variations of it. Um, and then, you know, ultimately I came to really respect that man and what he accomplished and what he produced in that company that he, um, took from the ground up and did some amazing stuff with. So I'm glad I didn't burn that bridge because, you know, he turned out to be a heck of a guy. So, what made one of them a screaming success and one of them not? Beats the hell out of me. And that's was really it a different important. audience or was it a different, <laughs> no. it was the same message. Pretty much the same message, just with a few words tweaked in here and there. And you know, I say beats the hell out of me because it's important to know that we don't know what the customer is thinking or wanting, right? So when I was doing my own 
pure stat stuff, I would always, you know, especially when it came to online stuff, I'm like, all right, so I'm going to tweak this message here and that's going to, you know, increase the click-through rate and conversion rate and all this other stuff. And I kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And my web developer, you know, finally convinced me to stop doing that and thinking I know best and always split test. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, Every time I did a split test, the one that I was pretty confident was going to be the winner was absolutely the loser. So split testing is critically, critically important. You never know what makes one a success over the other. I, I was in a room full of top direct response copywriters, and they couldn't agree on what the best headline was, which is exactly what you're saying. It's like, well, you just have to ask the customer. I mean, they're the one who's going to be buying the thing. So it's not yeah. about what necessarily you think it's about what the customer thinks. And so I love that. And so, okay. So you blew on the, the, the radio ads were amazing. Infomercial, not so much. What was another, and then you get to that point where you want to sell um, the business. Yeah. I'm going to just interject one other mistake I made along the way. So the infomercial didn't work, but the radio was just killing it. And I had hired a call center, uh, an outsourced call center to do that work. And they also did customer service. And, and I got greedy, uh, Jeremy. Uh, and I decided, you know, these customer service bills are a little excessive. All they're doing is answering the call. I can do that. I'm just going to bring it in house. So I got greedy and overconfident. And um, it led to something good eventually, but there was a lot of pain in between. Um, I sent an email to Frank, the call center, one of the call center owners and said, Hey, look, uh, I've decided to bring customer service in house. It was like on the fifth of the month. They said, beginning at the first of next month, I'm going to just redirect all customer service calls to my internal team. It took about a week for Frank and Jim to respond and said, Thanks for the update. Appreciate it. Totally understand your approach. Unfortunately, it's not going to be profitable for us if we're not doing customer service as well as taking your inbound calls. Therefore, effectively, the first of the month, we will no longer take your inbound sales calls either. And I was spending about $50,000 a week at that point on advertising. And I, in you know, all my you know, wisdom and experience, said, well, the hell with you two. I can't. All you're doing is taking inbound calls. I quickly drafted an email and said, no problem, guys. I'll just use a new call center starting the first as well. I'm not going to send you my inbound calls either. So I quickly shifted my $50,000 in media to a new call center that had no experience or training in that particular brand that I was selling. And it was an epic, epic failure to the point where I had to reinvent uh, the ad campaign to do free trials instead of risk-free trials, which just means buy it with a 30-day guarantee. This was buy it for the cost of shipping. And if you don't cancel, we will send you a three-month supply in 30 days. And um, ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, spending $50,000 a week on that campaign, taking my eye off the ball, I got an e email from my um, merchant provider that said, you know, basically, Mr. Valley, based upon the chargeback rate uh, at this point, we expect that uh, you're going to owe $250,000 in chargeback to the customers. So therefore, we're going to start withholding all of your payments until we reach a reserve of $250,000. Now, this didn't happen overnight. It you know, took another year for me to get to that point. Uh, and they were absolutely right. I ended up um, uh, paying back about $250,000 in chargebacks. Um, because of that. And that ultimately led me to go 100% online in 2005. And like, then forget the. Um, yeah, I just, I screwed up. I let my ego get in the way and told Frank and Jim to go pound it. And um, first it was greed, then ego. And I was running a great business. It, they were easy to work with. I just thought I was smarter and wiser than them. And uh, I definitely wasn't. So you go to sell. Mm -hmm. Then what? Um, I woke up, decided to sell the business. I had a great conversation with uh, one broker, brokerage firm, and it was Mark Doust at Quiet Light. The other two that I spoke to at the time, there were not many online business firms, uh, brokerage firms at the time, were just trying to get their hooks into me for a commission. Uh, Mark gave me some advice that was basically based upon your recent growth in the last few months. 
uh, things are coming back. You know, your business is getting strong again after the Great Recession. Um, I suggest you wait six months. And I was like, who the heck is this guy telling me to go away? Thinking about me first. I'm definitely using this guy. There's no question about it. And ultimately, when I came back, my business was stronger. It was more valuable. And back to Jason Yellowitz. Jason, uh, you know, was was my advisor at the time. He was the first entrepreneur turned advisor at Quiet and that's where the business model bloomed from. From Jason saying, "Look, Mark, I can do this. Give me a shot." And uh, he had it, you know, under contract in about three weeks, and I closed in uh, November two thousand twelve. I'm sorry, November of 2010. Um, and then uh, stayed in touch with Jason and Mark and eventually joined the team in uh, early 2012. I think everyone, maybe not everyone, but when I hear the story, I feel that people should aspire to work at Quiet Light because when you sell your business, people are like, what do I do next? Well, you get to help other entrepreneurs sell their business. It sounds like a cool thing to do, like an awesome thing to do and, and a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, it's a good gig. Do you, you get know? a lot of people after they have a few exits or an exit? They're like, you know what? I would just like to do this. This is a fun process. I get to talk and help other entrepreneurs. Yeah, it depends upon their level of experience and and where they are uh, in their life. But yeah, there's no question. Um, the, you know, they get to make as much, if not more in time than they do running that e-commerce business. And they get to do it with no capital outlay, no overhead, no boss. There's freedom and flexibility to work as much or as little as you want. It's a, it's a pretty good gig. Yeah. Do you think there is a place for radio now um, yeah. for in the businesses? Like I feel that is an overlooked medium for a lot of people. It's all online. Are people... Do you, do you uh, advise anyone now to use radio or, or should they be using radio? I don't advise them to use radio mm -hmm. because usually the folks that I work with, um, you know, they're up to their eyebrows in craziness in their business and they're just trying to keep the wheels on the bus. Mm -hmm. um, but radio, I think, is a definite, you know, avenue that still works. It's different than back in the day when, uh, you know, that was my primary business. But yeah, there's a couple of guys that I work with uh, back uh, in the Talk America days that are running you know, sizable media buying agencies focused on radio. Um, yeah, I love that. It seems like just an opportunity that's untapped because people aren't using it. Um, I want to talk about a few things and what to look for in a buyer. And it just reminded me when you said, when you hired that lady, you should have maybe turned away when she said, oh, 25,000. Because you talk about in the book and in general, one of the key things to look for in a buyer is niceness. Yep. Right. And people will take deals that are not as good based on that. So I would love for you to tell a story about that and what to look for in a buyer. Yeah. You know, I was, I was at a, a mastermind event called Rhodium Weekend uh, by Chris Yates. He also owns uh, Centurica.com, a due diligence firm. This is, the, I'm plugging all my friends' businesses here. Obviously. This is great. I've, uh, I've, yeah, he's, he's great. Great he guy. He's great. He's a great guy. Um, and I was up there on a panel with a bunch of different advisors from different firms and somebody in the audience said, look, you know, how do I compete against all cash buyers? What's the secret? And, uh, you know, a bunch of guys had very intellectual responses and I had one that was, you know, basically just don't be an asshole. It, it's pretty simple. You know, <laughs> that's the secret. Uh, and, and the next year at Rodian weekend, lo and behold, uh, I'm there and uh, a client that I have that just, he was not my client. He was the buyer, right? Of the business. He just won out on a $2.3 million purchase when he bought the business with an SBA loan, which means that he you know, had to get a 10% seller note. So $230,000 as a seller note when he was competing against an all cash buyer. So somebody's going to get 2.3 million at closing, or 2.3 minus $230,000, do the math real quick. It's a lot of money left on the table. Uh, but the reason he got it, because he was incredibly likable. He built a connection with the seller early on. He read the client interview and focused in what on what the seller wanted in this transaction. And one of the key things that he wanted in the transaction was to have his team intact and go with the sale. So the first all cash buyer was overly confident, braggadocious, 
thought he was the cat's meow because he could stroke a check for $2.3 million. Well, a lot of people can these days in this world that I live in. Whereas the other guy, you know, um, Nathan, Nathan saying he was just so kind, so likable. They happened to go to the same school, not at the same time. So he made sure he had the hat on. They talked about that. Um, wanted to really focus in on trans, you know, transitioning the team over. Um, and he made an offer that you would think wasn't going to work. But Syed, who bought the business, said, man, I, I'm going with Nathan. There's no question about it. So it, he just was more likable than the other person and cared about what uh, Syed built and wanted to take care of it and take it to the next level along with the people that helped Syed build it. And that, that closed the deal for Syed. Yeah. And that's just one, one example of hundreds. Um, there's a guy named Matt Howard out there, runs a company now uh, called Profound Commerce. Uh, he just raised $53 million to start buying up Amazon businesses. He bought uh, his first business through Quiet Light, no competition. It was not an FBA business or e-commerce. The next four that he bought he was never alone in making offers. Mm -hmm. The last one that he bought from me, there were 13 offers on the business. Matt ended up buying the business for $150,000 less than the highest offer because mm. he was much more likable. Have you found now, are you working with more um, aggregator companies? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. The, you know, for those that don't understand what aggregators are, they're really smart, likable people that are well-educated that raised funds to buy FBA businesses fulfilled by Amazon businesses. And they buy them up, they buy them at a low to fair multiple. And then once they put them in the portfolio, they get an immediate bump in valuation. They go from three times to 10 times because of the depth and breadth of their portfolio, because it's lower risk, higher value. Um, and what they've done, Jeremy, the aggregators, they've sort of opened the blinds to the sellability of online businesses. You know, uh, you know, our firm's been around since 2007 and we have not been able to do what they've done in 14 years, what they've done in three, just with headlines in the news and uh, reaching the sheer volume of FBA business owners first and trickling over to content and, and other uh, D2C brands that they do actually have a business that is valuable and sellable. Uh, and, and they've, you know, it used to, there used to be a huge disparity between, you know, a Shopify store uh, where they own the customer versus an FBA business where they don't. And that disparity has changed. The FBA businesses are not quite as valuable, but they're becoming almost as valuable. Um, and the, you know, year to date, uh, we've had an average of, you know, on, on FBA businesses, an average of something like four and a half offers. And the multiple is, you know, a full, full point higher on, on average than it was two years ago. What is, um, to give people a sense, the type of businesses you sell um, within the online realm, and then some range of, I mean, every business is going to be a little different, but people are always interested probably in the range of multiple that are within range. And we're only talking about this point in time that can change. Yeah. What are the type of business we mentioned? Obviously e-commerce. Um, what other, what other type of businesses should people look on your site? Because you, you can go right now on quiet light and go, listen, I want to buy a business, which is maybe saving tons of heartache and starting a business. I mean, I think starting a business, I mean, starting a business is tough. Buying a business, it, I believe, is a much better route to go in a lot of ways if you find the right fit, obviously. But um, you can go buy and you could sell businesses at Quiet. Yeah, you're so. you're, you're uh, much less likely to fail statistically proven if you, if you buy a business versus build. No question about it. You just get to buy. You got to buy the right one. And, and uh, oddly, people say, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start small, so I'm not gonna risk too much. I want to buy something for a hundred thousand dollars." But that that actually is a business that's much riskier than a million dollar business because it's smaller, less established, less diverse, hasn't gone through some tough times and recovered, doesn't have SOPs and all that good stuff. Uh, but to answer the question of what kind of online businesses do we work with on the sell side, it's really almost every kind. It is e-commerce, physical product businesses their own store or Amazon or any other third-party sellers, content sites, plentiful on the content site side, SaaS businesses, and agencies as well. Not as many agencies because historically agencies have been 
um, operated, you know, by the expert that did that out of <clears throat> their own expertise. But over time, what they've done is learned that the best way to build a sellable agency is not to make yourself the name and face of that agency uh, and uh, the, the true and only expert within the firm. Um, so really content SaaS, e-commerce agencies, uh, you name it. Um, but then there's some, you know, niches that we won't touch, you know, uh, there's no porn, no gambling. Um, we won't even touch e-cigarettes or vaping sites anymore. There's just the likelihood of them actually selling are just so incredibly low that we don't, we don't go there anymore. Plus, you know, some of the, 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 the advisors get to choose what they want to take on, which is great. And honestly, nobody wants to take those on anymore. Just a, it's a moral thing for most folks. What um, is the range? Like what's the low end of someone's like, you know, Joe, I'm thinking of selling my business. What's the low end typically are people coming to you and obviously it goes on up from there. Uh, yeah. So I think that is a really tough question to answer with any accuracy in a way that's going to be useful uh, for uh, the listening audience because every business is so incredibly different. Every business gets valued, not just on the numbers. The numbers are, uh, I'll, I say 10% of the equation in the book. Even if I'm generous and say it's, it's 50%, you're missing 50% of the equation in terms of evaluation. And that's, you know, the, 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 the risk of the business, the growth, the transferability, the documentation behind the business and you, the owner of that business, that all brings tremendous value that will sway the multiple one way or another. Now, to answer your question, in the last 12 months, 12 months, I'm looking at my screen over here, we've got our, our deal dashboard up. It's like um, comp for real estates, but it's only within our organization because nobody shares their stuff. Um, it's the lowest is, is a one and a half times multiple, and the highest is uh, 7.6 times mm -hmm. multiple. So a heck of a range. Um, the larger the business, generally speaking, the higher the multiple. So if you've got a business that's doing you know, it's, that has 10 SKUs, go to physical product e-commerce. If they've got 10 SKUs um, equally selling, you know, 10% each uh, and, but, you know, they're 24, let's call them 30, 36 months old, but they're only doing a uh, hundred thousand dollars in discretionary earnings, which is what the multiple is based upon. But then you have another business that's doing a million dollars in discretionary earnings. Same exact SKU count, 10, same spread, 10% to each SKU. That business is going to be so much more valuable than the $100,000 business just because of the size and scope of the business. That $100,000 business might be in that, you know, I'm going to give a broad range here again, because everything's different in that two to four time multiple range. And then the million dollar business might be in that four to six time multiple range. So it's, it, they vary greatly based upon the size and age of the business, the risk, the diversity, diversification profile. Um, and then of course, niche as well. Some of the, you know, the chapters of the book, um, you know, the, ex the Exopreneur's Playbook stick out to me. I mean, there's a lot of interesting um, information in the book and it's also kind of just the fundamentals and brass tacks with some people just overlook, like you talk about transferability and documentation, which is the non-sexy stuff that actually makes businesses run and actually makes it transferable. Um, and what stuck out to me, and you talk about the valuation multiples, structuring the deal, negotiating, all of those things. I wanted you to just talk a little bit about the advisors, like yourself, like who do you need to involve in this? Because I remember listening when, to you and Mark um, when you were discussing on the podcast, everyone should check out you know, the Quiet Light podcast too, that actually the broker that he ended up going with early on basically told him, you don't need a lawyer. You shouldn't bring a lawyer. Why do you need a lawyer? It's just going to hold things up. And you laugh, but that's the advice he got. Yeah. So what, what are some of the, and, and I, I consider if you are making a huge decision to sell your business, <clears throat> I'm on, of the thought of you should hire a profession who knows what they're doing has been doing this many times at quiet light, but you also recommend other advisors, at the table. So who else should people involve in this process? Yeah. Let me just say that you, you should hire a detached professional that knows what they're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Too many people like, eh, I don't need a lawyer. Well, you know what? My cousin's a lawyer. 
um, uh, never ever. Famous last words. <laughs> yeah, hire mother, father, sister, brother, cousin, aunt, uncle. I've seen deals fall apart because uh, attorneys that are too closely attached to you personally fight like rabid dogs for things that have a one tenth of one percent chance of ever happening. There's no fair and balanced when it comes to those situations. I've, I've seen people lose, you know, millions of dollars uh, because they hired the wrong attorney that was too close to them. But uh, if you look, you know, starting from the very beginning, the biggest mistake most entrepreneurs make is that they don't get their financials in order. They don't get their books in order, books, bookkeeping, not tax returns. There's a clear and distinct difference between a CPA and a bookkeeper. Uh, CPAs, you know, they prepare your tax returns, they make uh, tax mitigation recommendations, and they do all of that based on your books that should be produced by a bookkeeper, an e-commerce bookkeeper. Don't, don't confuse the two. They have distinct jobs. And in my experience, your CPA should not be doing your bookkeeping because they generally don't do it the way that it should be done. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, hire an e-commerce bookkeeper long before you ever think about selling your business. You can always do it after the fact, but it's a pain. Uh, and it just, it takes more time. And when you're emotionally done and spent and need to move on, and then you're told, mm, you got to you gotta go ahead and hire an e-commerce bookkeeper and put those books in QuickBooks and do it in a cruel format for the last 24 to 36 months, all the air is going to go out of your sales. So e-commerce bookkeeper, number one. Um, and then, then you're going to start talking to an advisor about the value of your business when you're ready, right? I want you to set a goal in terms of the exit, in terms of dollars, date, and feelings, and then reverse your engineer path to that. So I wanna sell for $5 million in uh, Q1 of 2023. And when I do, I'm gonna feel unburdened because I'm out of debt, my kid's college is paid for, and I can move on to my next adventure and spend more time with my family. So now you know $5 million is the goal. Now you're gonna know where you are today, value-wise, in order to get to that goal reverse engineering a path to that. And the book will get you 70% of the way there. Um, and it's really, the book is designed to help you navigate the whole process of even you know, starting to think about selling to actually selling either on your own or through an advisor. But if you can't figure out your current value, you don't know how close or how far you are from that goal. So step number two would be to hire an advisor with that. Um, and then along the way, as you're getting closer to that potential a uh, $5 million exit, I would say 12 months in advance, that's when you really want to hire a tax advisor to make sure that you're uh, creating this exit to minimize your taxes as much as possible. And there are some real experts out there that can help with that. Then you're back to the uh, advisor and you're signing that contract. At that point, you may want to hire an attorney for the engagement letter contract. Uh, a lot of folks do, a lot of folks don't, probably 50-50. Uh, there's not ever a whole lot of edits to it because, you know, it, it, I'm not advocating don't hire an attorney for the engagement letter when it's a quiet let engagement letter. You got to do what you got to do, but there's not a whole lot of edits that need to uh, go into it. Um, even for the letter of intent, I don't think you need uh, an attorney in most situations. Let's say if it's sub $5 million, if it's laid out properly, the letter of intent is really a non-binding letter of intent fully contingent on due diligence and a further detailed asset purchase agreement where you need the attorney um, and it's non-binding. So if in due diligence, uh, it turns out that your numbers are completely wrong and your buyer says, yeah, I'm out. Um, there's no commitment from either of you. But at some point along the way, you wanna have a, a conversation with a really highly qualified contract attorney one that ideally specializes in e-commerce. So they understand that you know, these businesses generally don't have a whole lot of assets. It's mostly goodwill. So either pre-letter of intent, pre-engagement letter, and definitely pre-asset purchase agreement, hire an e-commerce attorney. Um, that asset purchase agreement is the most critical part because that's the true legally binding contract that's going to hold your feet to the fire as a seller or as a buyer and make sure that you both sleep at night after the deal closes. And uh, you know, if you end up with any kind of an earn out or seller note, um, you know, the legal language behind that will reinforce how well you sleep at night and making sure that you're getting paid and making sure you're you know, fulfilling your obligation and paying as well. So e-commerce bookkeeper, 
tax mitigation specialist, uh, e-commerce bookkeeper, uh, advisor, broker, tax mitigation specialist, and sometimes that's your CPA. Then the advisor again, maybe the attorney for the engagement letter, letter of intent, definitely the attorney for the asset purchase agreement. And then after that, you know, talk to your favorite person in the world, your spouse, whoever it might be for figuring out what your next plan is. Hopefully you're going to take some time off after the transaction closes um, and just recoup and focus and get a clear head. Um, most of the most successful people do that. Some of, the, some of the most successful people don't and they wish they had. And they say, I'm going to do that the next time. But I definitely recommend some time off for sure. <clears throat> Last question, Joe. First of all, thank you. And I want to point people towards learning more, checking out more. Um, they can go to exitpreneur.io, check out more about the book. They can get a free chapter of the book. They can go on Amazon and get the book, the Exitpreneur's uh, playbook. They can go uh, to Quiet Light. Where else should we point people online, maybe within Quiet Light or, or anywhere else? Well, honestly, if, if, it's, if it's a buyer, you know, yes, you can look at Quiet Light's listings, and I highly recommend you do. You want to look at individual broker firm listings, uh, inquire on them. You, the listing that you see online, folks, it's just a teaser. You're not going to figure out the name of the business just by the listing. You don't have to learn anything. So you've got to inquire on it. You're going to have to sign a, not, sign a non-disclosure agree, agreement and then look at the full package to really determine the quality of the business and also the quality, quality of the firm and the brokerage firm that's putting that package together, especially if you're selling a business, right? Uh, you don't just look at the listing of a house that's being sold. You look at the virtual tour and go deep. You want to do the same thing here. Go deep before you decide to list with one brokerage firm or the other. If you're a buyer, yes, you can look at the quiet light listings. Yes, you can look at Empire Flippers or FE International, whoever you want to look at. But I kind of advocate not necessarily doing just that. And that's why I mentioned Centurica earlier. So Centurica, C-E-N-T-U-R-I-C-A, is a due diligence firm that gets hired by the buyer in due diligence to make sure the numbers are right. So I'm on the sell side. Um, but oddly enough, I really encourage people that are buying to hire a firm like Centurica to help them with the buy side. We want it to go well for you because you're eventually going to grow that and come back to us eventually <laughs> and sell it for you yeah. know, five times the value. But Centurica has a tab on their site called Market Watch. And what they've done is build an aggregator uh, tool. So they pull in all of the listings from all of the online business brokers. Uh, and you can, add, you, can, you can segment those and say, look, I only want to buy something with an SBA loan. And you can click that mark. That way you're not looking at every possible listing. You're looking at the ones that are already SBA pre-qualified. Uh, and you can do that, whether it's a SaaS business, e-commerce, you can break it down size, um, I think you may be able to do age. You can eliminate some brokerage firms. If you say, no, I never want to look at any of their listings. You can, you can do that as well. It's an incredible tool that uh, you know, I, wish, I wish we had built, but uh, you know, Chris has more foresight <laughs> than we do. I love it. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's great. Um, so as you can check out that, check out Quiet Light, check out um, the website for the book, uh, exitpreneur.io. And uh, last question, Joe, you know, we were talking before we hit record about um, the buyer changing their mind, or sorry, the seller, so seller. The seller changing their mind. Yeah. And um, why? Yep. And yeah. probably partly because of the advice. But I, yeah, lo I so love, before you answer that, I love what you said about, it's like, if they're successful, if you have a, success, a successful buyer, it's kind of like a real estate person who did great finding you a house. It's like, you end up selling it through them also later on when you move. So True. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. changing mind. Yeah. So, you know, uh, people ask me, you know, why I wrote the book. And for a long time, I had, I had trouble answering that question, you know, but it's, it's really to help people understand uh, and navigate the entire process of selling an online business. It's great for the buyers. If you want to get the other team's playbook, buy the entrepreneur's playbook, but it's, it's really the entire process and full of stories. And the, the one kind of story that I, I left out, is the surprising one. And there's, there's many of these examples. It's actually, we talked about a little bit with Lee in the book because she ended up listing it and pulling back and listing it again a year later. So focus in on Lee and her story in the book. Uh, but there's another person that I didn't bring up. Her name's Elizabeth. Um, we had talked for a couple of years, uh, Jeremy, prior to actually listing her business for sale. We sat down uh, face-to-face, -face, talked about 
uh, moving forward at an event called e-commerce fuel with Andrew Udarian. If you know, Andrew, yeah. I had um, Andrew on the podcast. Yeah, he's great guy. Great, got a guy. great community. Um, the uh, process that we went through with Elizabeth was, you know, deep and thorough uh, in terms of the current valuation, pulling the right levers to increase the value, pushing the levers to get rid of those things that decrease the value. And then a deep, deep written client interview is part of the process at QuietLight. And that deep written client interview asks every question we think a, a potential buyer is going to ask, and we have the owner of the business answer it in writing. Then we do a recorded interview, video, audio interview, as well as part of the package. When somebody goes through that entire process, what they begin to realize is often, hmm, I, I might have left a lot of money here on the table. There's some opportunities in this business that I'm really seeing that I didn't take advantage of. And if they have enough emotional reserve, and that's really key, you know, when you plan to sell your business, when you train for it and you set that goal, you, you will have emotional reserve when you get there. If you just wake up, decide to sell your business because you're totally toast and emotionally done, you're not going to have that reserve. So in the, in the case with uh, Elizabeth, uh, we got to the point where we're ready to list and it's a strong value. We're talking many, many zeros. Uh, she says, you know what? This has been very helpful. I'm not going to move forward yet. We've identified so many things here that I need to do, pull levers. And we're at the value that I wanted to exit at. But now I'm so excited about the business. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hold on for another 12 months. And I'm going to push that value a little bit more. We'll be back. Let's, let's just hit the pause button and, and, and talk again in 12 months. And oddly enough, that's really an exciting part of what I do. Um, it's helping entrepreneurs fully realize the value of what they have and making sure they take great care of it because these businesses are, are, are quite likely their greatest asset in terms of value, more than their house, their car, their investment portfolio. These things explode in value very quickly. And if they don't understand what levers to pull, they can lose value very quickly. But in her case, and in many other cases, you get to that point, you're like ready to move for you. You pause, you reflect, you say, I am going to go ahead and move this goalpost. Hang on, I'll be back. And when they come back, that business is so much stronger, not just for them, but for the buyer, which is really exciting because they're building a better business, not just for themselves, but for the buyer. And ultimately it sells for more value and the buyer's buying something that's more stable and will grow much more quicker. So eventually they can turn around it and, and sell it for a higher value as well. So it's, it's, it's odd when, um, you know, you, you, you get less selfish and you always think about the other party and do the right thing and how that benefits you. And that, Jeremy, as you probably know, comes with age and experience. It's a long game. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's a long game. Yeah. Yeah. Having uh, other people's interests. At yeah. Heart. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't know that at 22, 25, 28, heck, probably even 31, 32. But when you're in it for the long game and you're doing it right, um, it's better for you. It's better for the other parties as well. And it works out incredibly well. And you do what Rise 25 does so well, which is build beautiful relationships with great people. Amen. Everyone, thank you for listening. Check out Quiet Light. Check out Xpreneur.io and the Xpreneur's Playbook. Joe, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, Jeremy. I appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.